Readings and Reader. Hello, welcome to YCFD. I'm still incredibly ill for those who watched last week. I have descended a bit in the hour since we recorded the last one. We've also lost the camera. Yeah. So there will be no Sam Cam for this week and maybe next week. So I apologize for the drop in production. But if some things just can't be helped. The driver's just, our driver's just died. Yeah, I'm sorry, you're not going to get close ups of this. I feel like the movie we've picked has kind of led to the technical issues we've been having, <laughs> having today. Yeah. So. We were scrolling through show and we wanted to pick an 80s slasher to watch, like just a, a cult cla- a cult classic, Jeez. I suppose, something cheesy, something we didn't have to think Jeez. too much about. And so we came across a film from 1986 called Sorority House Massacre, which is actually a spin-off of Slumber Party Massacre. Our old friend. And what I find quite unique about this, one thing, it's also written and directed by a woman, just like the Slumber yeah. Party films are. I don't know if the sequels are, because this also spawned two sequels. There was another spin-off, which is either Cheerleader... Masker or cheerleader camp masker with from in like the early two thousands. So, the Slumber Party trilogy spawned two separate spin off trilogies and then a remake of itself. Yeah, Slumber Party Extended Universe. I guess so. Yeah. Who would have thought it? That's uh, that was interesting. Produced by New Concord. Yeah. So it's Rod Corman's production company. So you know it's going to be on the cheap. Uh, what was the name of the director? <laughs> uh, Carol Frank. Carl Frank. So she was actually an assistant to the director on Slumber Party Massacre. She was, yeah. The plot of this film actually is kind of interesting. So it revolves around the character of, is it Beth? Beth, Played yeah. by... Angela O'Neill. Angela O'Neill. She moves into a sorority house and starts having dreams of this strange man. I want to say right off the bat, all the stuff that's in the dream sequences is filmed incredibly well and is quite creative. So we also, we see this man in an, in an asylum. So they have this psychic... Link, and then he feels the urge to break out and make his way to the sorority house, killing people along the way. So yeah, so this kind of cool setup of these two that are linked for some reason. Mm-hmm. The film kind of doesn't really do anything with it, with this interesting premise, and this whole this whole film can be summed up with wasted potential. And it's it's kind of sad to me. Like I didn't not enjoy it. I also did not enjoy it. This is the thing. No, I didn't like, not enjoy it, I think is what I meant to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We both had fun with it. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is uh, it is what it is. It was. I don't actually have the budget for it, but I mean, this is one of the lowest budgets of the of the 80s. It's like, you know, mutilator vibes, similar-ish <laughs> in, in terms of the acting prowess, in terms of the script and, you know, in production value... Very, very, like, bottom tier. But there is still fun to be had Yeah, with it. You are absolutely right. There's definitely some similarities to Slumber Party Massacre. Yeah, totally. like, it's yeah. almost cut in, like, carbon copy, cut paste. And it steals a lot from Halloween, which I think it was criticised for at the time. The material that it's given, like, like I said, you're, you're absolutely acting in this is atrocious. The lead, no offence to her, is awful. But it's not just her, it's everybody. It's okay, I just killed Tracy. There's no urgency. No. Help. Help. Mutilator is a really good comparison, actually, because we had fun with that film, even though it is the it's atrocious in so many different ways. Yeah. Like, the production, acting. Gems. But what that film had was kills. Yes. Really good kills. Exciting ones. This film doesn't. We're going to segue quickly into You can see how this is inspired for your things. So the knife that the killer actually uses is very similar to the knife used in Scream. But everyone in this film dies by... Stabby, stabby. Stab, stab. So it's like, ah, oh, it's a little bit... This is where you really need your interesting premise to come forward. Because the, yes. like I said, the visions are interesting. And so, so I revealed a twist. I think we got to. We, we got to, to yeah. yeah. It's the only thing this film has. <laughs> yeah, so what we actually... I can appreciate about the killer. Although he's boring as fuck. He's just dressed in black. I like seeing the killer's face. That's something I liked about Summer Party as well with mm-hmm. uh, the Driller Killer. I, I yeah. I really enjoyed that. Uh, but then he just he basically does just do walk like Michael Myers for the entire thing. So he is in an asylum because he killed his family when he was younger. Yes. Stabby stabby. With a pickaxe and that and that knife. Yes. Uh, I wish the pickaxe made an appearance later on in the film, but it doesn't. That's a shame. Uh, one member of his family survives, which is revealed to be Beth. And a nice little deal because we see in her visions like a family portrait of uh, 
with, of some young girls and they're all like bleeding from certain parts, which assuming is where they got stabbed. And she, what, there's one who's been bleeding in the arm. Yeah. And she, she often is often is holding her arm, holding she the scar. Has no memory of how she that she has gone. no memory. So I'm like, all right, I kind of like that. Maybe that's like the cause of the of the psychic mm. of the psychic yeah. link. And she was she was five when this yeah, happened so, as well. So, yeah, so she they has are, no memory. They are siblings. That is literally, you know, from follow on from Halloween two. He wants to kill his family and he's going to go kill his siblings. He wants to kill his sister. Yeah. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. We'd like to shout out our Groovy members. We appreciate everything you do for this channel and helping us grow. You guys are awesome. This is where I think they really could have played off the psychic link a little bit more. I wanted some scenes in the house where like maybe if they don't know where he is and then suddenly she has a, you know, a link with him, a quick like daydream almost and can see through his eyes. That would be so interesting. Mm. But it, but it doesn't do it. The sorority house that she moves into also is the house that she grew up in when the murders happened. Yeah. What are the odds? What are the odds? What yeah, are the exactly. odds that, <laughs> that the college yeah. would buy an ex-murder house for one of their like for sororities? Yeah. But yeah. I guess I don't, the unis don't own the sorority house. I don't. We, we don't live in the States, but... We don't have sororities. What are the odds of, of that? All right. So he goes to a store to steal a knife. And kills him. Twice, like that old man when he gets stabbed, that is the best acting in this Honestly, movie. Honestly, no, is it is. Like, death. that was, like, excellent groaning on that man's part. Yeah. So when he gets to the house, he goes to the fireplace. Uh... Because she has a vision early on of a knife that was hidden in the fireplace after some murders. And, oh my God, there's this knife. And they think it's a prank. Some they of the think few. the boys are pranking, some but it's like an old knife. So then he comes back to the house to get the knife. But what I never got, I think mean, we debated this, I was like, but he's already went and stolen the exact same knife from the store. What's the point in coming back and picking what? up the same knife? I feel it's like... not like he used that knife to kill his entire family. Like I said, he used a pickaxe as well. I was like, I tell he had an idea here and that maybe... I think the knife was going to be symbolic in some way, but it just came across as lazy to me. <laughs> I mean, like, you've got a perfectly good knife that you've just stolen and yeah. already killed people with. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm going to put that aside and take this rusty knife <laughs> that I hid all these years ago. Really, this is such a, this is a pressing issue for you and with, with this one. It is. I don't know why I took such <laughs> offense. Everything. I don't know why I took such offense to it. <laughs> we have an issue with the knife. I um, I mean, look, th there is right. Let's just let's backtrack. The interesting thing about the movie, the most interesting thing, it is the premise. I think we both agree that, like, in terms of an idea, this is actually quite interesting. You know, the psychic connection between this mystery man and this young woman, what is it? Um, the dream sequences. And yeah, praise where praise is due. Bad acting aside, the dream sequences are actually pretty decent. And there's one kind of extended one where she she's asleep in a in a dorm or you know whatever you call them over there in her bedroom and she's outside and there are three girls on the lawn and each of them tell her don't go into the house don't go into the house and she's like why and i think they say like oh he's waiting or something like that very nightmare on elm street vibes mm, yeah it's like there's a mix of halloween and a little bit nightmare inspired as well because there are a lot of dream sequences in this um, and, you know, the three girls, like, yeah. you know, one, two, Freddy's coming for you. I'm sure it would, must have been inspired by that. So she goes into the house and, like, there's these, the three girls are now mannequins sitting at the dinner table. And it looks weird. It's, it's, it's really, fuck. Like, it's eerie. It's very eerie. Yeah. It's like, that. those sequences, again, like, I think we both agree, like, done very well. The, the dreamy sequences, very eerie. But that's kind of the most i don't know like in in terms of well the cinematography is actually not that bad throughout the movie as far as it goes but i think in terms of like you know visuals and aesthetics <laughs> that's kind of the dreams is like the most visually compelling that, that we yeah. have um i'm trying to think like what else i really did enjoy about this movie i mean there was one thing that i it's kind short. of it's a short film so th the fact that it takes place in a sorority house um i it's like christmas well, Black Christmas, yeah, but I was also going to say, like, there's a true, real-life true crime oh, yes. connection, too, which I was, I think I asked you to Google it, just in case, like, it was actually inspired by it. I don't think there is, don't think there is a connection, but um, famous, well, notoriously, um, in 1978, um, serial killer Ted Bundy killed uh, two women 
in a in a sorority house. I think it was the the Chai Omega House. Yeah, 1978. So less than 10 years before this movie was made. I think he attacked several women, but he he killed two. And um I think in my head as I was watching it, I was like, I wonder if this movie was in, maybe inspired by that in some way. I don't think it is. It's like it's not on it's not on trivia or anything like that. But in in my head that kind of like I weirdly have that connection now which just sort of makes it a little bit more eerie we've talked in the past as well about how sorority houses and um fraternity houses are kind of like fodder for american yeah. horror films like you can you can be quite imaginative with them uh, yeah. but yeah you're right there are like black, black christmas echoes in, in the movie too they always have to the, the, the sorority always has to be empty yeah, there like, always has to be a reason why there's only a few remaining girls. Yeah, it's one original thing is like the psychic link, and it's not even entirely entirely original. This is one of those films where if you had a few people around, you'd had a few drinks. It's a fun background one to put on because you know it's just cheesy slashing. You're gonna have some. Uh, I was laughing my ass off at certain bit like bits yeah. of bits of dialogue. Yeah, <laughs> and I only heard about this from documentaries. Over the night, like, I think it would be lost. And we found it on... It was on Shudder, wasn't it, this one? That's, it was, that's it was just we, on Shudder. That's, what, that's where we picked it up. And One interesting bit of trivia, which I, I quite liked, is Angela O'Neill accepted the role before she got... Have I got that right? Is it Angela O'Neill? Angela O'Neill, yeah. yeah. She accepted the role before getting the script. Not realising the script required nudity. Because Roger Corman produced film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they need that, that booby quota. We do have the booby quota. Yeah. And she wasn't comfortable with doing nudity. And to be honest, the scene that requires nudity, it's not even a good scene. It's just, they're just trying, like, yeah, is it that, it's the house mother who's, like, also went, so they're trying on a wardrobe. It's like, I think it's one of the girls. It's one of the girls. It's not, not even that clear. No. They're just, try, they're just trying on clothes. And it's one of those ones, like, did this need nudity? It's one of them. But uh, yeah. basically told her, well, it's in the script, you know, so you, you've got to do it. And she basically said, well, no one. They were on such a tight schedule. I think this was only there was a shot in like two weeks, and because she held out and they were so against the clock, they had no choice but to just accept that she wasn't going to do it. Mm. So throughout this whole scene, her friends are like getting you know getting the booze out, trying on clothes. She's just sitting on the bed. It makes the scene feel really destroyed. But I'm really glad that she stuck up for herself oh, for that one. Yeah, absolutely. Because this is not a movie that's worth. Yeah. Getting undressed for. That is, it's, it's kind of like a recurring theme because I think it was Slumber Party Massacre 2. I'm pretty sure there was an actress that didn't, also did not want to do a booby shot. She didn't yeah. want to do a nude scene. And I I might be wrong, but just from memory, again, the director respected that. Yeah. And it, it is, it's an interesting thing because, yeah, Slumber Party, the first one, there was a lot of female nudity in it. And to the point where we we questioned it because yeah. oh, because they got that booby quarter done in one scene. In one scene, and I think it's a shower scene. Yeah, right. But then you also have other moments where you know, like the camera just zooms in on a lady as she bends over in like a gratuitous yeah. ass shot. It's like, did that really need to be there? And it just kind of raises this question of just you know, just because a movie is directed by a woman, it doesn't by definition make it a feminist film. And I know in in Slumber Party there was a quote, there was a literal quota that had to be filled. And I think the director, to her credit, said, well, okay, if we need to do this, then we're going to do it in the most non-sexual way possible. And hence the shower scene. You know, it's like it's a woman just getting out of a shower naked. It's like, okay, there's nothing sexual about that unless you make it sexual. And then in this movie, yeah, we've got all the girls, Beth, Sarah, Tracy, Linda, for anyone who's interested. They're all just trying on clothes in this, you know, other girl's wardrobe. And one of them, for some reason, doesn't have a bra on. So she's just taking off her top and you see the boobies. There is another shower scene as well where you see one of them get out of the shower and she's topless. Yeah. So again, it, it is, it's female nudity, but it's not done in an overly sexual way. And we also saw on Wikipedia that something this movie has subsequently gained praise for is its, um, its feminism. Or, you know, like its, it's portrayal or, you know, it's like yeah. its themes. Not that I did not. I did not pick up on that. It's so. This is. I, I, I don't. With, equally, though, it's mentioned in Wiki. Yeah. But we don't know what the original source of that is. It's like where are the reviews no. coming from? And I think really what it can come down to is maybe like the context of the nudity and that it, it, it's not sexual. And um, so maybe there's a bit of praise there. 
But I guess also just in terms of the way and like just how these these friends kind of interact together, the female friendship, because, you know, you've got that weird montage scene where they are trying on clothes and there's that song playing in the background and it's like it's just girls having fun and it's just girls being girls, you know, being silly and trying clothes on and all of that stuff. It's like it's celebrating female friendship. Um, and also, I suppose, like, this is a stretch, but when Beth does start saying, you know, I'm having these really weird dreams and I, I don't know what's going on and I'm scared, none of the girls dismiss her. You know, like, all of them say, like, you know, all right, well, let's try and get to the bottom of this. Let's try and figure this out. So I think in a way, like, again, it's a push. It's a big, it's a big stretch, but, like, perhaps the, the praise of its feminist qualities just comes from the the fact that it's a film that is kind of about female friendship and you know like it's a positive exploration and portrayal of it i don't know i think i'm talking bollocks now i'm stretching i'm so i'm really aware that i'm I'm stretching this movie i do think it'd be it's a fun one to watch i don't know if i'm ever going to revisit it unless i specifically want to show a bad movie yeah because like i said there is enjoyment to be had in just how bad it is and the, yeah. the remnants of an interesting idea i think i do actually think it's something that would warrant yeah a remake yeah it wouldn't even need that big of a but like that big of a budget no it's just just a you know better directing better script and better acting you know the three the, the holy trinity of filmmaking yeah <laughs> yeah the, unfortunately the pinnacles that i needed film. to make a good movie yeah uh so i don't know about it i'll look into the sequels for this one i've got zero interest i would rewatch this one yeah. I actually found, I, like, as, as frustrating as I found it and as laughable as I found it, the, the premise alone I did find quite interesting. Yeah. Um, there are, like, some scenes specifically that... Are you all right? I'm surviving. I'm surviving. <laughs> yeah. There are some scenes specifically that I'm like, oh, my God, that is painful. Like, there's a scene where one of the girls, I think it's Linda, and she wants to have sex in the teepee. It's such a small teepee. It's the tiny... Like, I'm not even talking like it's a big thing. It's tiny. It's, it's not like the a cold. Of the chair. Yeah, it's like, how... What? Th- there's nothing even sturdy that you can, like, lean against. Or, you know, like, there's no wall in there. <laughs> they couldn't have went and bought a slightly bigger teepee. Honestly, it's... it's so, like they've went yeah. and bought a kid's toy. I know, honestly, it was the most laughable thing. And then, you know, she's trying to make out like she's really turned on. Like, hey, let's go have sex in the teepee. Also, when they go outside, you can see their breath. So it's like, that is just not going to be a comfortable yeah. experience at all. I don't find it funny that he, then, obviously, after the, some stabby stabby in the tent, stabby stabby. he has to run off, like, just butt-ass naked. Yeah. Oh, I did like that one of the other, when he gets inside, one of the girls is like, huh, you're bleeding. <laughs> like, she was going to say, you're naked. And then she realizes, oh, and he's been attacked. Yeah. Quite like That's that. when his awful dialogue then comes into. Do you have any more on this movie? I don't think so. Like, there's more painful moments in it than good. I think we've established that premise good really good just everything else kind of lets it down and it's frustrating one to research because there's so little trivia on it there's no trivia like that the cast members even the director it's like you go and click on their name and well you can't (laughs) like there's no link there i don't think any of these people acted again not that i can find anyway I can't even find numbers for like no. what its budget and box office was, but obviously it must have done, like it didn't have to do amazingly in order to get sequels. It just had to make its money back, and these were famous to be incredibly cheap. And you know, a trilogy came from this. Yeah, it's a very I don't know. Like at its heart, I guess it's a very American movie. Anything to do with fraternity, sororities, it's like it's so intrinsically American, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> so it is what it is. Because we were the biggest fans of the original Sun Party Massacre. No, if I remember correctly from our original video, but it's a better movie than this yeah because it's just a bit more interesting and compared i know it's, it has nothing to do with mutilator but i would rather much mutilator over this one yeah if i want to watch a bad movie that is entertaining mutilator is the one yeah for the kills alone it's uh yeah for the kill for the kills for the kills alone yeah so yeah yeah if you have a shutter subscription that is i wouldn't go out of your way to seek this if you already have a shutter subscription or a free trial mm. and want to like just ingest this era of horror and slashes and basically we're still seeing the essentially the fallout of the rise of Halloween and Friday the 13th. Because you got to bear in mind, around this time, those films had also started to dip off in quality. Yeah. So naturally they're 
knockoffs are going to start dipping in quality as well. So it, that would be the only way I would recommend watching this movie. Yeah, so definitely. So you got anything more to say on this one? No. Well, thanks again. What are your... I want, give us some more bad but entertaining slashers. That, that's the key. They, we have to be entertained by it. I don't just want to watch something because it's bad. If I want to go out and find just a bad movie that I'm not going to enjoy... But that just sounds like an awful idea. Like, no. Yeah. Bad but enjoyable. Cheesy. The cheesier, the better. Jeez. So, thanks a lot, guys. And we will see you next week. Bye.